One more person. That's all. That's all we need. Did you fail, Duncan? You didn't. You didn't get a rubbish. <laughs> okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much for coming along to uh, to room ten, which I think is also confusingly named, I don't know, room twenty-five as well, or something. Uh, this is the Dynamic Coalition on Public Access in Libraries. Uh, my name is Stuart Hamilton. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the Director of Policy and Advocacy at the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, or IFLA. Uh, IFLA is the co-convener of this dynamic coalition, along with Electronic Information for Libraries, who unfortunately can't be with us today, uh, but still remain a, a strong member of this coalition. The coalition itself um, held its first meeting last year at the IGF in Baku. So this is the second meeting, uh, and as I understand is customary, it's, uh, it falls to me to give you an update on the activities of the coalition over the past 12 months. Um, that's going to be just one of the things that we're going to be looking at today, though. Um, so I'll give you a bit of an idea of, of what we're going to be discussing um, I will run through what's been going on in the last 12 months to begin with. And one of the partners in the Dynamic Coalition, the Beyond Access Initiative, will follow that with an update of what they have been achieving over the last 12 months. Their mandate is very much uh, public access to ICTs through libraries, so we'll look forward to hearing what they have to say. But what we're going to try to do with the bulk of this meeting today is to move on a little bit from one of the strong points of the IGF, which is talking about doing things, to actually discussing what the library community is going to do about a specific issue. And that issue is the formation of the new post-2015 development framework, which is currently under discussion at the United Nations. It's a very complex um, framework process, which is why we have brought in one of UNESCO's best men, uh, Cedric on my right here, who has a slide which will explain everything. Um, we're going to have a bit of a panel discussion for that, and I'll introduce my panelists uh, uh, as, as when we get there. Um, and that panel discussion is going to lead us, I hope, towards a bit more of an understanding of what libraries and their partners, because we really very much want to use this meeting to reach out to other organizations, to talk about what can we all do together to ensure that access to information is included in some fundamental way in the UN's post-2015 framework. And then when we've had that discussion, uh, we'll finish the meeting today with a short introduction to a, a major IFLA project which was launched in August, which is the IFLA Trend Report, uh, which looks at uh, some of the changes we can expect to see in society over the next 10 years or so uh, and what their effects on access to information is likely to be. So I'm going to begin, I'm going to be doing the talking, unfortunately, for, for the first part of this session, um, just by running you through the business end of the meeting. Um, on the screen to my left is a slide um, that on the left-hand side in the action column 
states uh, the activities that we said we would undertake as a dynamic coalition uh, between the last IGF in Baku and the IGF. <laughs> Um, we, I think if we were going to do a report card, which will be kind of marked by ourselves, uh, I'd give us a, a, pretty, a pretty good mark for what we've been up to in the last 12 months. I think being a dynamic coalition in the IGF is, uh, is something that can be quite difficult sometimes. You are very often trying to inform members of the coalition of your activities <laughs> whilst <laughs> or seven other, <laughs> other hats. Uh, and in that respect, I think we've actually done quite well to stay on track with our action plan. One of the first things we said we would do was to take a look at other similar dynamic coalitions within the IGF and to contact them to explore areas for collaboration and synergies. And I'm pleased to say that we actually uh, had some very positive responses from the Dynamic Coalition on Internet Rights and Principles and the Dynamic Coalition on Network Neutrality. And we've been involved in their sessions here at the IGF um, this week, and they've been involved in ours. So already we're crossing over nicely to the work that's being done by other Dynamic Coalitions. The second bullet there, and in fact probably the main bulk of our work this year, was to identify active national and regional IGF chapters and events and to engage with them to create possibilities to put public access in libraries onto their agendas. So that involved a bit of a mapping exercise to understand where national and regional IGFs were taking place uh, and making sure, where possible, we were able to put library people uh, either to attend or to participate in panels. So in the last 12 months, we have been active at um, the Arab IGF, which took place earlier this month, uh, the African IGF, which took place in September, uh, the Asia-Pacific Asia IGF, which also uh, took place, I think, in the last four weeks, and at the European Internet Governance Forum, or the Eurodig, in June. And whilst we've been actively involved in a number of sessions at all of those uh, IGFs, I can say that at Eurodig, we organized two workshops, uh, one on copyright, intellectual property, and access to information, and one on public access to ICTs for vulnerable and disadvantaged persons. And then at the Asia-Pacific IGF last month, we organized a workshop on public access uh, to ICTs in the community. So it's been actually very pleasing, the, the feedback we've been getting from our appearances at these um, events, and uh, we would have actually uh, had representation at the uh, Latin American IGF if the organizers had actually included contact details on their web page and responded to repeated emails uh, for us to, uh, to attend. Um, the next thing on the list was that we were going to look into hosting an open forum during the IGF, uh, and we've just uh, co-hosted one earlier this afternoon which looked at the recommendations that came out of our workshop in Portugal at the Eurodig on access for vulnerable and disadvantaged people. I should point out that we do have reports available for all of these activities, and if you are interested, please see me and I can share information on what we've done. I think the one area where we've, or uh, well, you can see there's a big gap in the next bullet point, the one area where perhaps we have more to do which is to promote the mailing list that we've set up for the public, uh, for the Dynamic Coalition, to people outside of the library community. When you set up a Dynamic Coalition within the IGF, you do have to have support of a number of different stakeholder groups, and we were successful in getting that initial support. But I think since then, I think it could be said that we've remained a little bit too internal focused, and I think there's more work for us to do um, to actually bring in people from outside of the library community over the next 12 months. So there's no point in, in not being honest about that. We'll have to up our game in that area. We have, on the other hand, uh, paid attention to our core constituency, and we have produced and shared uh, information across the library community about the IGF, Internet Governance, and the Dynamic Coalition. So um, IFLA has prepared a new set of web pages on the Information Society, which contains very basic primers on what the WISIS process is, what internet governance is, um, and I've put up uh, URLs there. I think one of the most important things that we did this year was update IFLA's position 
on internet governance. Um, we produced a position on internet governance in 2003 when the first WISIS um, uh, when the WISIS process was first kicked off and the first meeting took place in Geneva. Um, and we've updated that statement to really reflect the changes over the last 10 years. And if you visit the web pages which I've listed there, you can find the new IFLA position on internet governance. Um, obviously, making plans for this IGF was a big part of our activities. Uh, we've had a number of workshops here uh, where we've been represented, um, mostly looking at access for disadvantaged and indigenous peoples. And I can see a number of people who've been at those workshops. So first of all, thank you for coming to those workshops. And second of all, thank you for coming on to this dynamic coalition meeting. Um, early this morning, we had representation also on panels relating to uh, copyright. We were also doing a, a workshop on copyright yesterday. And we were in a workshop on internet neutrality um, earlier this afternoon. So actually, it's the dynamic coalition on public access in libraries, but the library footprint at the IGF is a little bit heavier than just public access. And we do cover a lot of other topics, which of course will eventually um, impact on the sorts of frameworks that let us provide access in our libraries. And uh, the last dot point there was to propose public access as a main session theme for the next IGF. We did submit uh, comments on the, um, the structure for this IGF, but uh, public access was not uh, chosen as one of the main themes. But we will continue to, uh, to blow the horn for public access. So at that point, I'm just going to stop. Um, there's the business side of the meeting is almost slightly closed and just ask if any of you have any questions about what we are or what we have done during the last 12 months. At the end of the meeting, we'll discuss very briefly uh, what we plan to do over the next 12 months. But do any of you have any uh, questions about what we've been up to? Thank you very much. Don Hollander from New Zealand. And you mentioned the, the involvement in regional IGFs around, uh, around the, the world. What about national IGFs? Have you or, or constituents uh, been active in, and from my perspective, quite particularly in the Pacific? Actually, uh, we have, I'm pleased to say. I, I perhaps really should have put them in there. Um, our German colleagues have been attending the, the national IGF there and also us in, in, uh, in Denmark in Europe. Uh, Winston Roberts from the National Library of New Zealand attended um, the closest thing, I think, to a, a New Zealand IGF. Um, and I'm also pleased to say that it was Winston, along with a representative from IFLA from the Federated States of Micronesia, who attended the Asia-Pacific Regional IGF, where we particularly focused on the public access problems of remote and small islands. Um, I'm trying to think off the top of my head other national IGFs that we've attended... Um, and I'd have to go back in, in the records. I think we did have somebody at the American uh, one. Um, but we, IFLA itself has been, able to, has been lucky enough to be able to fund participation mostly at the regionals. And we've paid more attention there because we hope that our members can try to go to the national ones under their own steam. But I think uh, as part of the mapping exercise, we know that these national IGFs increase year on year. So we'd, we're really interested in trying to get people to them. There was another question from this lady just in front, if you... Uh, I'm Savitri from Indonesia. Uh, I hope it is on, not only provide the library itself, because, uh, for example, in my country, uh, uh, even there is a library, but the person sometimes, they, uh, they don't have uh, just the... the I mean, uh, how to encourage people to read, to understand, to choose the the uh, the uh, uh, good book and spread the information to the communities. It is more important, I think. Thank you. So you're talking about the 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 sort of need for literacy yeah. development programs yeah, yeah. as well. I think it's fair to say that that's something. Well, that's something I certainly hope all of our members are, are doing all of the time. Within the context of this dynamic coalition, I think that we're not looking at literacy programs explicitly, 
But I, I would like to think that some of the work that we're doing through programs like the Beyond Access program, which uh, Rachel will talk about in just a moment, but also through the work of sort of um, IFLA's members, are you know, uh, helping to build literacy efforts around the world. I can tell you that explicitly we have been working on not just basic literacy, but media and information literacy, which of course is a, a different type of literacy. Uh, but we are about to have a set of recommendations on media and information literacy go before UNESCO's general conference next month with the hope of having them endorsed as a UNESCO document. Nonetheless, to address your question very directly, we see it clearly as one of the main priorities for libraries in, in both developing and developed countries to ensure that we are cultivating a culture of reading um, and you know, helping people access our resources for increasing their literacy. Okay. Um, oh, another question. Uh, the, the lady's uh, question and your response, Stuart, uh, reminds me of another development. Um, at least within uh, America, I have been reading that libraries increasingly are disposing of their books, of their physical copy books, and moving toward e-books and other types of media. As someone who grew up on books, I view this as quite alarming as someone who considers that probably most of the world is not necessarily going to have access to, to uh, electronic media, but, may, but more likely would have access to books. I'm very concerned about this trend and wonder how that, is that in fact a trend that, that you're seeing and how does that fit overall into the access to information movement? <clears throat> Okay, this is a worthy of a workshop in itself, I think, this question. I'm conscious that actually in the room there's an awful lot of library expertise. I'm looking at you, Margaret. Um, because I think, I think we will try and tackle this very quickly, this question, because I think uh, we meet once a year in this environment, and uh, it is true that there's a, a shift from print to digital in some of the more developed countries, and that's obviously going to be held up as an example in some ways in developing. But we did have a quick conversation about this the other night. I wonder if you might say a couple of words about what it's like as a public librarian to, to deal with that. Hi, I'm Margaret Allen. I'm uh, CEO of the State Library of Western Australia. So we have responsibility for um, helping public libraries in WA with their stock. Um, it's a very difficult question because there's a lot of emotional attachment to print um, I grew up on print, I understand that. But libraries have always reflected what their communities want. And certainly in a lot of developing, uh, developed countries, people want electronic books. So we're responding to that. In the case of public libraries, their collections have never meant to be long-term preservation collections. They're supposed to be collections that are active, dynamic, and meeting their users' needs. And, have it, and we know from... Um, study that if you have old books on the shelf, um, it actually detracts from your use. Libraries that have switched to actively weeding their collections, making sure they look, um, look good, that they're changing and have lots of content refreshment, actually see their usage go up. Um, so it's a very, very difficult issue. Um, one of my colleagues in Queensland has done some research on expectations of both library members and non-members about print versus e-books. Um, that's the Brisbane City Council Library. I think you can find the slides on their website. And um, that shows in some categories that there is going to be a big shift to digital, but in others such as children's, people are still saying that they want to print. So I think it's something that's not yet settled, but importantly, libraries are there to help serve their customers' needs if customers are demanding e-material, then libraries need to respond to that. On the other hand, if you look at my state library, which is a preservation library, um, we're also making some really hard decisions about storage that we have, what's being used, what's available digitally, and what we might actually actively deselect from the collection. But it's not our preservation, our legal deposit 
um, collections. These are other collections. So it is a very difficult issue um, for staff working in libraries, for clients. Some people find it really difficult to reconcile um, that actually we are moving books out of our organisations. That I'm not sure. I don't know. I mean, there's certainly issues of access, lack of access to um, sufficient material in other than English um, in digital form. There's not a lot of it. So, you know, um, those markets suffer from not a large publishing industry anyway. And then if you look at um, hardback versus um, uh, e-book, that's another challenge entirely. And many of the large publishers are not, you know, we know that we're having difficulty as libraries actually even getting access to e-book content. There are publishers that refuse to allow us to access it under any conditions at any cost. So that's another overlay um, of the dilemma. And that's a, that's a whole other workshop as well. That it one. certainly is. How, however, D Duncan does have a comment. If you could just introduce yourself as well. Um, so my name is Duncan Edwards. I'm from the Institute of Development Studies in the UK, and uh, we do a lot of work within um, the Global South, and particularly with libraries. Um, I think one of the things that's kind of important to kind of register within that debate is um, the use and value of material beyond the kind of immediate community that an individual library is serving. So what we're, we're doing a lot of work in terms of digitization of material that isn't available anywhere else. So it's not available electronically. So we're trying to get that kind of material available within the kind of global kind of knowledge pool. And I think it's really important to, to think about that within that, um, within that debate. So. Okay, so I think uh, with the questions on there, I think we'll move on. Uh, and I'd now like to introduce uh, Rachel Crocker from Beyond Access. Uh, Rachel's going to introduce us to what Beyond Access is. I know many of you in the room will already be familiar with this, but uh, we'll also hear about what's happened over the last year or so uh, in the Beyond Access program and what you've got coming up next. So, Rachel. Thanks, Stuart. Um, yeah, so my name is Rachel Crocker. Happy to be here to sort of share a little bit about what Beyond Access is and what it has been doing over the last year. Um, so for those of you that don't know, um, Beyond Access is a coalition of 11 organizations um, that work across the world. Um, and they work um, with support from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, our driving goal is to see libraries recognized as a catalyst for development um, of both social and economic development. Um, so to achieve this goal, we sort of have three main areas that we work in. So the first one is really building up a community. Um, so we have we pull in teams um, from we have currently have teams from over thirty countries. Um, all of these teams, some of which are actually represented here today, um, are composed of three types of members. So each of them include one librarian. Um, one representative from government, and one representative from civil society. Um, this, we feel like, really provides the, the a pattern that we're looking for of starting to build partnerships across sectors um, of libraries actively partnering with government and civil society um, to contribute to social and economic development. Um, to build up, help build up this community, we've held three regional events this year. So the, the first one happened in September in Latin America with 12 teams from Latin America. Um, our second event is finishing right now with 12 teams from Asia and Europe. And then we will have one more event in December um, with teams from Africa and Europe as well. Um, the goal of this is to really sort of recognize and support libraries and that are doing innovative activities, that are doing more than just the traditional book lending activities, but are really actively involved in their communities, are really providing access to information and connecting that access to information um, to the ways that it helps promote the development and the improvement of their communities. 
Um, and a key part of that as well is starting to work to change the perceptions of how people see libraries, um, working towards people recognizing libraries not just as book lending institutions, but as really vital um, information points, public access points, um, community centers within their communities. The second piece that we're involved in is, is contributing to the dialogue that is happening in development and policy. So we want to make sure that libraries have a seat at that table, that they are actively involved in events just like this one. So we support libraries coming to, to IGF. Um, we also help um, libraries attend and present at other international development conferences, really getting the library voice outside of the library echo chamber um, and contributing to post-2015, as we'll hear in a little bit, um, as well as just other policy discussions. As a part of this, too, we also actively produce publications, um, promote through our blog and through social media, the ways that we're contributing that conversation. So along those lines, we've actually brought a number of those publications with us. Um, I've set them all out on the table in the back. Um, we have a series of policy briefs um, talking about the ways that libraries are connecting to key issues. So this includes open government, this includes public access points, um, connecting girls in ICT. We also have a number of briefs on specific countries that we're working in and how they're being involved they're involved in policy discussions and social and economic development and that sort of moves us to our final piece which is building partnerships so we currently have four test projects that we're running right now um, these are in the Philippines in Myanmar in Peru and in Georgia and these projects are really working to prove that our ideas work in practice that you can actively build these partnerships between libraries and government Governments, between libraries and development organizations, um, and that we can expand the work of the library. So the goal of these projects um, will be to insert libraries into different types of programs. So some of them are, are more traditional literacy programs, um, but also we're looking at libraries being inserted very actively into open government initiatives, into e-government initiatives, um, into promoting economic opportunity um, into expanding those sort of in those key development areas, inserting libraries practically um, into those policies and development projects. And we're aiming to do this around the world. So we have four test projects right now, um, but in the coming year, we'll be expanding this part of our project to build up more of these um, partnerships um, in connection with connecting libraries to government and to development programs. Oh, yes. Um, if you want to find out more, I um, invite you to check out our website, which is just beyondaccess.net. Um, and there you will find an ongoing blog where we sort of hit on these key development issues, as well as profiles of all of our member teams, um, and, and as well as electronic versions of all of our policy briefs. OK. Um, I'm conscious that we, uh, we actually want to get into a little bit of discussion or we, we really actually want to get to the point where we are talking about um, how do we share some of these great examples with policymakers who are now looking at defining the next development framework for the world's na uh, nations. Um, and to do that and to help those of you in the room understand what is actually a pretty complex process uh, I've been very lucky uh, to have been joined by my panelists here who are going to attempt to explain to you um, what is going on and why libraries and why those of us within the IGF who are concerned with access to information should be um, aware of and willing to engage with the post-2015 development framework process. So we're going to have three short presentations um, first of all, on my left, uh, Duncan, who's already introduced himself, is going to be talking to us about uh, access to information and development. Um, then he'll be followed by Ari Katz uh, on the right-hand side of the panel, who is a Beyond Access um, manager, director, um, who will also talk a little bit about the same subject but begin to bring libraries in. Um, and then we're extremely lucky to be joined um, in place of Mr. Yanis Karklins, who was unfortunately unable to join us today, but uh, Cedric Wachholz, 
uh, which I sincerely hope I've pronounced reasonably collect correctly, um, who is a program specialist at UNESCO. And uh, believe me, you do need the specialist part of that job title to um, understand what we're getting ourselves into here. Um, once we've had these three presentations, um, I'm hoping that you'll understand a little bit more about uh, what is going on. But before we start, I'm going to attempt to introduce exactly what's going on, and then we can see if my interpretation of this bears any relation to reality. Um, the United Nations, as many of you will know, uh, defined a set of Millennium Development Goals, um, which are due for, shall we say, completion in 2015. Um, I'm sure some of us will have been involved in those processes um, and maybe have contributed to the achieving or almost achieving of those goals. In order to um, review and report upon um, whether or not they met their targets, the United Nations has instituted a um, review process to assess how well we did and at the same time um, is undergoing a, a, an extensive consultation on what the next development framework should look like. Um, and as you can imagine, there are a large number of um, civil society organizations and member states involved in these discussions, all of which have uh, an interest uh, in seeing their particular issue be addressed in this framework. The eventual framework, I am sure, will cover a lot of very important topics. Um, but the point I'm trying to make is that if you are not involved in the discussions around this framework, there is no reason that you should feel that the issues close to your heart and librarians feel that access to information is an issue close to their heart. If you don't get involved in this process, then you cannot expect to get anything out the other end. So, we are now into the sort of last 18 months of the review process and the development um, framework, or the development of the development framework process at the United Nations, and IFLA is engaging. Meanwhile, and here comes the slightly tricky bit, and Cedric will explain this as well, there is a kind of parallel review process that is going on, and that is a review of the World Summit on the Information Society, which took place in 2003 and 2005, and the IGF, of course, is one of the products of that process. That is also currently being reviewed uh, by UNESCO and the ITU with a view to um, perhaps decide what comes next beyond WISIS. And Cedric will set me straight on my interpretation of this. But the basic truth is that there are currently two review processes going on that anybody who is concerned with access to information, whether it is in a development sense or whether it is in an ICT sense, you have to be involved in these processes if you want to ensure that your issues will come out the other end. What is unclear, and uh, I'm really looking forward to Cedric's uh, presentation, is exactly how those two processes uh, will meet. For example, if the WISIS review will end up contributing to the eventual development framework. There are some people who feel that that is, or at least should be, an inevitability because there really is little value in having another two parallel processes looking at development in its broadest sense of the term after 2015. So the challenge for us, as people interested in public access to information, is to work out how to engage with this process. First of all, of course, we have to make a case for our involvement. And here I'd like to hand over to Duncan, who can talk in a nicely general sense, I think, about the relationship between access to information and development. And from there we'll go to Ari, and from there we'll go to Cedric. And after that, we'll open up the floor for a bit of discussion. And then I'll tell you a little bit about what IFLA intends to do and how you can help. So, Duncan. Okay. Well, uh, thanks. Um, just to give you a bit of background on where I'm coming from, um, I work for an organization called the Institute of Development Studies, which I mentioned earlier. Um, we're primarily a research organization um, looking at kind of social and economic development issues primarily within developing countries. Um, 
the organization has a good uh, has a big kind of research department we also have a postgraduate training um and uh, training is that the right term yeah uh, you know, masters, PhD programs, things like that. But we all also have quite a large res um, kind of research and knowledge services department, which looks to get the findings of research used within policy making and with within development practice. Um, where I sit within that is um, I specialise in looking at the role technology and the role information knowledge can play within policy processes. Um, so Stuart's kindly asked me to speak about IDS's perspective on the priorities for the post-2015. I'm not going to do that. Um, I'm going to give you a bit of context um, about how, I suppose, the world has changed since the MDGs are set, because I think that's really relevant to how we're thinking about um, what should come next. So... Um, the world itself has become more kind of interconnected. I think that's fair to say. Um, it's also less secure. Um, and also the kind of development and aid landscapes have changed quite significantly in that time. And, you know, there has been significant progress towards the MDGs. Um, there's also the kind of notions of what developed and developing actually means. Um, and this kind of outmoded, I suppose, you know, countries like Brazil, India, China, you know, they're, they're, they're a kind of new force that's emerged in the last 10, 15 years. Um, and also, if you look at countries within Africa, that, you know, we're seeing record levels of economic growth. Um, but then some of the very kind of complex challenges that existed within the kind of the era of the MDGs, they still exist, but there's new, I suppose, new issues, um, kind of levels of inequality within countries arising. Um, might be interesting to note that the majority of the world's poorest people actually even live in the middle-income countries. Um, and kind of thinking about some of this, it's kind of looking at how things need to change in the post-2015 framework, I think you need to look more at um, in, uh, increasing participation within all sorts of areas of society, including the post-2015 process itself. Um, you look at the way in which the MDGs were set, that has been kind of highly criticized for the lack of participation in how that agenda came about. Um, Another area is, is recognizing and focusing on some of the political dimensions of social development. That, you know, we, we, we talk about information, we talk about decision making, we talk about um, all sorts of processes, but we don't tend to talk about the politics of what we're doing. You know, we've all been sat in this meeting over the last in this in this forum for the last few days um it's what, what what's happening behind those closed doors you know we're in these kind of big plenary sessions but actually what's going on and what's not being said and i think that's a kind of inter it's it's a really important thing to kind of bring center stage if we're actually going to make any difference um another a key theme, I think, is taking more a more coordinated approach to um, to development. Um, if you look at the MDGs, they're, they're very siloed. You've got environment, maternal health, blah blah blah. But the actual links between them aren't particularly well um, integrated, I suppose. And looking at other policy processes like WISIS, why why hasn't M the MDGs integrated closest with WISIS? Um, so I think those are the, I suppose, key things to think about. Um, and then if we bring it back to um, the question of access to data, access to information, I think we need to recognize that um, this hasn't necessarily come up particularly strongly in a lot of the post-2015 um, consultations. But where it has come up in areas like corruption, um, corruption, um, governance, should I say, um, transparency, accountability, 
the kind of data and freedom of information, so on, has come come through very strongly. Um, so, in terms of my thoughts on access to information and, and data, is that they will be critical and they are critical. But um, and it would be great to see a kind of increased prominence of access to data and information. Um, but I think we've also got to be uh, strategic or we, we, we kind of really got to think about how you advocate for that. Because um, if you think about like information and access to information in itself, it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily have any value. Um, it's how, you, how information is applied within different, say, decision-making processes, um, how it might uh, empower people. Um, that's, that's where the value is. It's not in access. Um, so, kind of <laughs> beyond access, let's plug. But I, I, I think when I say beyond access, I, I, I'm kind of pushing it even further, I think. But maybe we can have that debate later on. Um, so what else? Um, talked about needing a more integrated approach. And a, prob uh, you know, a problem with the MDGs is they didn't really speak to each other effectively. But then you know, if you look at the whole information community, um, there's a huge wealth of experience and skill in the kind of categorization of information. And if you combine that with some of the technical advances in kind of linking data, information, you've got a real power to bridge some of those silos. Uh, another quick thing is the, uh, that we really need to think seriously about is the kind of balance of information and data that's available on the, on the internet. It's, it's dominated by um, data and information that is produced by huge northern organizations. And if you look at that within um, how you might make decisions and so on, it, it's deeply problematic that there isn't a voice there in terms of information and data that is being generated and originated in the rest of the world. Um, so I think that's a really important thing for libraries to be thinking about. Okay, Ari, do you agree? <clears throat> yeah, I think there's some, some to agree with and some that maybe we could uh, discuss further. Um, so just to introduce myself, I'm Ari Katz from the organization IREX. We're an international development organization based in Washington, D.C., and we manage the Beyond Access program, which, as Rachel said, is a coalition of 11 organizations. Um, and I guess... Duncan gave us a lot to think about kind of uh, kind of philosophical considerations about where we're headed as far as uh, as far as access to information and, and participation in the post 2015 process. I guess I want to kind of drill in on one very practical goal that we have. So um, among our, the Beyond Access Coalition are, of course, IFLA and uh, Eiffel, who are the organizers of this dynamic coalition. Um, and we just very practically want to get a goal, a stated mandated goal into the post-2015 development agenda on access to information. And that's because we think that that will open up space uh, in the political discussion within countries uh, on the international stage that libraries can insert themselves into much more easily. So then why do, we, why do we think that that's important? So <clears throat> let me go back to kind of our thinking process behind this. And, I, you know, Beyond Access um, really starts from the idea that you can't talk about development in the 21st century without talking about access to information. And probably most of, most of us in this room agree on that. We wouldn't be in this room if, if we disagreed. Um, but there's one example that I think really kind of uh, underlies that point. And uh, it's, it comes from a study that was done by uh, a couple of uh, American academics a few years ago. Um, and they found that 80% that of malaria cases in sub-Saharan Africa 
were treated outside the formal uh, medical infrastructure. So they were being, being treated informally by families, by communities. And of those, something like 73% were uh, either mis- some something like 73% were either misdiagnosed or mis- mistreated. So, uh, so most cases of malaria uh, are treated outside formal medical infrastructure, and most cases of malaria are being treated wrongly. And what they found was that uh, the instances of death from malaria were directly correlated to the availability of information and communications infrastructure uh, nearby the case of malaria. So the, it just demonstrates how critical uh, information is uh, to underlie all kinds uh, of, of development goals, even the most basic health goals. Uh, clearly, the connection there is that people who have access to information are less likely to misdiagnose uh, a disease and are more likely to know the correct way to treat it, or at least who to who to appeal to in order to treat it. Um, and of, so that's just a, a health goal, but of course, uh, uh, access to information supports nearly every uh, development goal. Um, certainly part of the uh, discussion of the post-2015 uh, development agenda focuses around uh, participation and governance and transparency. And I think, you know, it's, it's obvious to all of us in this room that you can't, have, uh, you can't have sufficient participation. You can't have even the most basic level of participation or accountability for, for government uh, without some way to connect to government, some, some means of exchange between citizens and government. And so there I, would, I might push back a little bit on, on Duncan's, uh, Duncan's point about access not being enough. Certainly, you know, we believe beyond access. Access isn't enough, but it is, is a first step. You can't talk about these other things unless that access is there. And that's why we think that it's so important uh, as, as a development goal. Um, so so I, I guess that, that brings us back to the post-2015 agenda. You know, beyond access, uh, you know, uh, another kind of uh, point that beyond access uh, revolves around is this fact that there's 230,000 public libraries uh, in developing countries. And, you know, it's come up over the past few days. Maybe we even undercounted uh, that number. So this, there's this huge untapped resource that's specifically dedicated, historically uh, dedicated to, to access to information that typically has been left out of the development conversation, typically has been, uh, has been ignored when, when development efforts are planned. Um, and we think that's just such an, uh, an untapped opportunity, such a missed opportunity. And, and as the world is having this discussion of what's going to be the development agenda post-2015, we want to make sure that that doesn't happen again. So we think it's critical that libraries are part of the discussion as we're putting, uh, as the world is putting together the post-2015 agenda, uh, that we're represented in that discussion. Uh, and we're really pushing for access to information to be part of that agenda. Um, so that, that when, it's, when it's encoded uh, in the agenda, then we can all go to our governments and say, this is a, a commitment that you've made. This is a responsibility. Uh, we're not going to achieve these other development goals without an access to information infrastructure. Let's make sure the libraries are able to contribute to it. Authentic. Yes, thank you. My name is uh, Cedric Bachholz. I work for UNESCO in the Knowledge Societies Division, and I have the privilege of being able to stand up <laughs> while most of you need to sit a little bit longer. Um, oh, I, I can do it. Thanks. Uh, so uh, I work in UNESCO on WISIS. Uh, I coordinate UNESCO's so WISIS work, and WISIS stands for the World Summit on the Information Society, and Stuart has already given a very good introduction 
um, and I think I can slip a few slides for that reason. I will also speak about post-2015 uh, development agenda, about the links, as I was asked to, to do. Just where we stand currently, um, there, there, uh, the United Nations Group on the Information Society foresaw uh, three different steps towards the UNGA, the United Nations General Assembly Review, in 2015. The first one is the UNESCO WISIS review, which took actually already place in February 2013 in Paris. So I saw a few of you uh, did join us in Paris, um, and I'm happy to see you back here again. Uh, the next meeting is scheduled to take place in April of 2014. It is ITU hosted, and it is the second WISIS review conference, and then uh, the UNGA will have a review meeting in 2015. And I will just briefly go through these different elements and say uh, to come to where we stand today. Um, this is a photo of uh, the conference we had in February, uh, and there are different outcomes. We produced a number of working papers, and there's a final statement which was adopted by all uh, participants during the conference and which will feed also into this uh, uh, 2015 process and uh, into this review process. And there are a lot of recommendations which came out of the about 80 sessions. So there were 1,450 people who attended and we had also many remote participants and um, people from 130 countries attended this conference. And um, now I, I come to, a, uh, to the second, the ITU event, because the objective of my presentation is once to give you an overall uh, view, but also uh, a way to understand how you can influence uh, and contribute uh, to the agenda. And we are in this preparation process for the second review meeting, actually in phase three, which means uh, we have already had one physical meeting at the ITU, in, uh, in Geneva, and now comes uh, the next, the second physical meeting at the ITU headquarters. And this is actually a quite important meeting because there, there will be the zero draft really developed. And if you want to have things in, uh, in the Swiss Plus 10 review documents, you need to contribute to that uh, now. And I actually want to, to, to highlight again how you can do this. You can access documents here on the WISIS doc slash review, and everyone is invited and contribute, and you need to do that before 17th November, and there will be no extension of the deadline. You know? So uh, this is important, so every one of you can contribute, and this is the way to do for the time being. And, uh, and then you can also, of course, attend the meeting. It's an open meeting, and you can also participate remotely uh, from 16th to 18th December and, and contribute and participate. Now, uh, yesterday, actually, uh, the second committee uh, at the UNGA started to meet on the ICTs for development. Uh, oh, the United Nations uh, General Assembly in New York uh, is meeting. And there's a second committee who works on ICT for development. And it's an important uh, committee for this entire WISIS review uh, process. Actually, uh, they have to define the, the final modalities of this WISIS review. And they tried to do that already in 2012. They failed. And they have to do it now again. And uh, yesterday it started. Some 31 member states will take the floor. Uh, they will continue today, and they will discuss uh, the resolutions there. And we are contributing, of course, uh, but ITU uh, and UNESCO are both just observers. So we will speak after all member states have spoken on this. And, I mean, in a few, perhaps uh, today, tomorrow we will know more about the modalities of the WISIS review. So uh, that, will be, that will be good, because we've been waiting a long time for this. So now I think we can nearly skip this slide because you, you, you designed the, the, the framework. And actually what's important to, to understand, it is uh, on one hand you have the MDG review, you have the WISIS review, but you have also the sustainable development uh, goals which came out of, of Rio plus 20. And it all meets together in, in the, in the post-2015 development agenda, at least ideally. And, and there you have a lot of different elements uh, and groups. You have the open working group of the GA, which has about 13 members. 
and if you have any questions, we can speak afterwards. I will be brief. Uh, you can come to me. Uh, you have the high-level panel of eminent persons on the post-2000 development agenda. You have national, global, and thematic consultations. You have the UN Global Compact for, more for the private sector. You have consulta regional consultation. Oh, you have, again, the UN Global Compact. <laughs> and you have Sustainable Development Solution Network. Uh, Jeffrey Sachs leads this with research centers, universities, with thematic experts who, I mean, who also support uh, the high-level um, uh, group. And, of course, you have uh, it all. Uh, you wonder how this is coordinated, and it is as complicated as this. <laughs> and so if you think it's not all easy to understand and to, to contribute to that, you're right, uh, because it is a complex process, and it has been mentioned before. The idea here is that uh, the, the, the post-2015 development agenda will not be, again, a just UN-driven thing. And you have, therefore, these different groups and these different bottom-up processes which should all contribute in this quite complex process. And I see a lot of Indonesians participating here. So, for example, the high-level panel uh, was chaired also by the Indonesian uh, president. So that would have been, or that's an entry, you know. So there are different entries to that. And I think the importance is really to get to, to member states which are really important in this process. I see. Uh, I think that's it. I know, just to say, we ourselves uh, as the UN uh, developed, I mean, we, we in the last WISIS review meeting asked for this link, of course, to the uh, post-2015 development agenda, and 30 UN organizations developed a joint statement on the post-2015 agenda exactly stressing uh, the public access to information, the strengthening of ICTs in this process, and so on. But we are just UN organizations. And in this process, it is really driven by member states, by civil society, and so on. Our role is clearly to just facilitate uh, and provide expertise. So thank you very much, Cedric. Thank you very much, Ari. Thank you, Duncan. Um, I really wanted to bring this to your attention as people who are interested in the dynamic coalition because of the big task that lies ahead of us. Um, as I said, this offers us an opportunity to go a little bit further than discussing our ideas uh, and our theories here at the IGF. It offers us an opportunity to put into practice our advocacy skills and our communication skills at communicating the projects that those of us in the room who are involved in libraries are involved in, and the projects that other organizations, perhaps civil society, perhaps business, technical sector, uh, are working on in relation to access to information. Now, I'm conscious of time. Uh, I'd like to just uh, allow us uh, about 20 minutes now to perhaps pick up on some of the themes that have been discussed in the panel uh, before we finish up with about 10 minutes just looking briefly at the IFLA trend report uh, and inviting you to comment on where we go next with the Dynamic Coalition. I'm also conscious there was a lot of information to take in in the last 20 minutes. But I'd like to turn it over to you uh, if you have any questions for the panelists or questions about what you can do to get involved or if you need any clarification because once we've gone through a bit of this, I will tell you exactly what IFLA is planning to do and how you can get involved. But first of all, any, any clarifications needed or questions? I can see gentlemen there, so... Do we have a microphone? No, no, we'll, we'll wait for the mic so everybody can hear. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, and hello. if you could introduce yourself. Uh, Khaled Hijab, Jordan, um, Tech Tribes organization. Uh, just a couple of clarification because we were talking about it and terminology, nothing more technical. Uh, so, um, so we figured out what this is. We, we, we kind of uh, looked it up. The second would be um, the gentleman from UNESCO talked about submissions and November 17. So we had a discussion about what those submissions would contain and how would our contribution add up to to whatever we're, we're required to submit. And the second thing, um, is there an Arabic or other language version of the website? Because we're trying to kind of understand the, lang the, the website in our own language, but you know, that's not available. Thank very you. good question, the last one. I, I can take the contributions in just a moment. Perhaps Cedric can talk about the other language possibilities. Yeah, I'm afraid. 
Um, so this is a, an ITU hosted website and ITU has a policy of publishing everything in English or in the six languages. Uh, for us it is uh, oft, uh, always, for UNESCO, always uh, the six UN languages which includes Arabic but here it is only in English for the time being. You need to see that this, these are, I mean it is a, a big uh, problem and challenge uh, but these are still uh, working uh, documents which will evolve a lot uh, at the fi I mean, at a later stage, of course, they will be there in, in six languages. But uh, unfortunately, I'm afraid it is only produced in English so far. What is asked, um, what has been produced so far, is a vision for the future. Uh, there are different pillars, like key elements, and different action items. You know, in some areas, access to information, I think there are already up to 60 or so uh, contributions. Uh, but, uh, but they are quite diverse. It doesn't mean that the end document will include all that. For the time being, it's a cut and paste of all contributions. Afterwards, I mean, sometimes it's exactly the same, then they are rephrased and they are not re re taken up. But so far, there is no cutting down uh, of this. So all contributions are, are there. That was the first uh, phase. Um, now you have these documents and everyone can still contribute and comment on them. So on any of these vision pillars or activities. So I can say that IFLA submitted, uh, has, is, is involved in the submission process uh, and pleased to say that many of the things that we submitted in relation to access to information have gone through the first round of um, document creation. So I'd be happy to speak to you about um, submissions and also anybody in the room who wants to uh, know a little bit more about the exact you know, modalities in that process, I'd be happy to speak to you. But we will, IFLA, on behalf of the library community, um, will clearly respond by the 17th of November on the latest round of documents. But that does not mean that, that other people can't in the broader community. Gentleman at the back. Hi, thanks, uh, Stuart. My name is Yudo uh, from uh, University of Indonesia. I work as a lecturer over there. Uh, I feel very happy that now in this IGF we have more voices from librarians. So to have a uh, more direct impact nationally and regionally, if, let, if I may encourage you, then uh, we also have the national IGF, IGF Indonesia. And it, in region, we also have Asia Pacific uh, Regional IGF. I attended the APR IGF last month in Seoul, and as far as I know, we haven't seen any, any session or any workshops uh, from the IFLA or from the librarian's point of view. Uh, here, if I... here in Indonesia or in... No, in Seoul, Korea. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, last month. There was one, but we... But we uh, Open access. With uh, pu public access public to access. information. Okay, yeah, great. So, uh, uh, looking at the Beyond Access uh, initiatives, it would be great if, let's say, we can replicate their uh, initiative here in Indonesia. I mean, if uh, I mentioned up to you about the mobile telecenter initiative in Indonesia, and if, let's say, the National Library of Indonesia can command all the public library in municipalities to open also internet access here, then instantly we will have more than 500 telecenters who will give access to uh, people here. So thanks also to UNESCO for having the WSIS so, since now. Our government has a commitment to, have, to provide 50% of our population to have access to information. When I mention 50%, please do realize it's 120 million, so about five to six times population of the whole Australia. <laughs> so uh, that's all my comments. So if let's say we can have more collaboration with either nationally or uh, regionally, then that would be great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Duncan. I just, I just think it's um, just to be good to clarify <laughs> uh, my point. Um, I, I, yeah, I truly believe that access to information data is fundamental to moving forward and um, informing decisions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. What I'm saying is that that's not enough. That if you're articulating um, a vision that access to information and data is really important. Um, you've got to look at some of the, uh, the other elements that mean that it's actually usable. So um, the, um, one of our participants was talking about things like literacy. 
uh, information literacy capacity to enable people to utilize that information, internalize it, take action, rather than... Can I just uh, say... <laughs> I fully agree with the last point made. Uh, and UNESCO actually uh, tried to, to develop also a concept around that. Um, not only are we also speaking about media and information literacy, we also tried to speak about not information society, but inclusive knowledge societies. Because it is not only about having access to a lot of data and information, it is about the question, how do I transform it into knowledge? If I have a big book, where it's written how to operate an appendix, it doesn't mean that I know how to do that. And so it is about transforming information into knowledge. So we like to speak about inclusive knowledge societies in our vision and our future perspective. But of course, it's based on data and information. No, no of course, uh, no disagreement from me on any of that. I guess what, what I'm wondering, and you know, this is also my first kind of experience trying to, um, you know, participating in an effort that's trying to get something uh, integrated into the, to the global agenda. But uh, I guess my feeling about that is that, like, you, it's absolutely right to have that discussion. But we have, like, if we're talking about getting um, a goal that libraries can respond to on the post-2015 development agenda, it seems like it's got to be pretty straightforward and, and basic. If, if we're advocating for all of the elements of an information society as part of a post-2015 agenda, we're going to find ourselves stuck in having that conversation. So it, I guess that's just the, that's, that's been kind of, you know, as we've been discussing this within Beyond Access, um, that's kind of been our, our, uh, you know, the, our starting point is that if, we gotta we gotta get this access to information goal on, onto the uh, onto the agenda into the framework, and then you work from there within countries uh, or or regionally or whatever to to make that make it useful. But that's that's the basic starting point, and it's unlikely that you're going to get more than that. So this is a, a good moment to switch to sort of what is IFLA going to do. So the people who are sitting on the ends of the tables, uh, now you'll find that there's a, a pile of documents. Uh, if you could pass them to the people on your uh, left or right. Um, uh, yes, if, Ari's got a comment to make whilst we're doing that. Sorry, I just wanted to point out just totally uh, on another topic in response to the gentleman's uh, comment from Indonesia that in this room are some representatives from the Perpusero program, which is doing exactly what you suggested uh, happen in Indonesia, which is connect libraries to the internet. You should connect with them. <laughs> okay. So what we're distributing here is um, what you might call the, the base of um, IFLA's advocacy activities in relation to the post-2015 development framework. It is a high-level statement on libraries and development. Um, it is, I believe, sometimes referred to, or the type of statement which is sometimes referred to in advocacy circles as a motherhood statement, um, which means that uh, hopefully nobody could be against it on the grounds that who could be against motherhood. Um, but further than just that, it contains at the very end the three dot points that we really would like to have achieved as we move forward into advocacy in this environment. Um, we've talked about making a goal within the context of the post-2015 development framework, and we will set out on that path. But our overall objective is that any post-2015 development framework recognizes the role of access to information as a fundamental element supporting development. So that could come in the place of a standalone goal, or it could come uh, with information being contained within, for example, a goal on governments, accountability, uh, corruption. Um, we also want the framework, if possible, to acknowledge the role of libraries and librarians as agents for development. And we would like to see the member states of the UN support the information frameworks underpinning development. Uh, that would include libraries and other public interest bodies. By setting ourselves these three goals 
for our engagement with this process, um, we give ourselves something to aim for. And IFLA is now getting more and more involved in both the processes that Cedric has outlined, uh, and we are going to be calling on you as members of the Dynamic Coalition on Public Libraries to help us achieve this. We will need a few things from those of you who are interested in this topic. First of all, if you are not members of our mailing list, then you absolutely must sign up so that you can keep in the loop on this. And you can find details of the mailing list on the IGF pages of the Dynamic Coalition. Um, and that is under the subsection Dynamic Coalitions. Once we've done that, you'll be able to keep in touch with the activities that we are undertaking. We will be engaging with the UN through the various mechanisms that Cedric's mentioned. We hope to hold a side event at the General Assembly meeting in December on the subject of access to information. But we won't be doing this alone. We're very conscious that this is not something that should be just libraries. Access to information is about more than just libraries, and already we're working with civil society organizations such as Article 19, Civicus, um, and development initiatives who are all very heavily engaged at the UN to hopefully put on this um, side event at the UN in December. Um, we're at the very beginning of a process that will see a very high-level declaration issued next August on the importance of information to development. And we're seeing that as, shall we say, um, a real opportunity to build a, a large coalition of groups around this issue so that we can make a big public statement and put it into the system uh, around August time. At the same time, we're engaging with all of the WISIS process. We're making our submissions. Uh, and in many ways, the issue of access to information through ICTs is perhaps easier to bring out in the WISIS Plus 10 review process because it's perhaps a little bit more connected with um, the ICT side of things. So in order to tell our case persuasively, we can't just say, we can't just keep reproducing this motherhood statement. That's not going to be enough. It helps us as a base for our advocacy, but we will need to illustrate why we think libraries and information can play a role by using the examples from you in your everyday work and from organizations that you work with who are doing good things with access to information and through as many different partner organizations as we can that will support this um, goal of ours. So there's obviously got a lot of work to be done. IFLA is going to be coordinating it. And the first thing I'd like to ask you to do is to sign up to the public uh, access uh, dynamic coalition mailing list so that I can keep you all informed of what's going on and how you can help. Now, we're almost at the end of this meeting. Uh, before we switch subjects entirely, are there any sort of questions uh, remaining about what we've just been discussing for the last half an hour? It is a lot to take on, and I'm pleased to say that IFLA will be providing a set of web pages that explains all of this uh, in a, um, a bit more detail and also in uh, a few more languages, which I know will be quite helpful for a lot of people in the room. Any further questions before we move on? Then I take it that you've all uh, completely understood Cedric's slide and uh, we're all ready to start advocating, which is great. Um, so with that, Duncan, I know that you have a plane to catch and you're under no obligation to, to stay here. So if you do want to slip out, that's fine. Um, we'll start talking about you and your ideas as soon as you leave. But I'd like to introduce my colleague, uh, Ellen Broad, who's recently joined us at IFLA. And she's going to say a few words about something which I think will also be of interest to you, particularly relating to uh, public access to information in the next decade. Uh, and that's the IFLA trend report. So Ellen, over to you. So I will be very brief because it's almost 6 p.m. and it's been a very long day for quite a few of us. Um, I only wanted to mention this briefly as something for you to take away, to read back in your offices, and also because it picks up on a lot of the points that were made by our panellists here. And in fact, it picks up on quite a few of Duncan's bigger outside of access to information issues like the kind of context surrounding the information environment for the next 10 years. And that's the trend report. I'll just 
Um, could we just move forward? Because I'll move straight to the insides document. Yep, this one. So oh, I've just realised the link on there is incorrect too. It must be, the, is that the PDF or the PowerPoint? Sorry, but it's just go to trends.ifla.org. Um, the Insights document is being made available in multiple languages. As soon as we can get the language centres to translate them, we currently have translations in Spanish and Finnish. There is an Arabic, a German, a French, a apparently Myanmar, Japanese, Vietnamese, I believe. There's a number of translations taking place and we will continue to make them available online as soon as they become available. At the moment, we only have Spanish and Finnish, but we're in the process of getting all those other translations. But this document captures the variety of information contained in the trend report. The trend report is not a report itself. It is a platform, trends.ifla.org, and it pulls together 12 months of meetings and conversations held with experts from outside the library profession. So educators, IT professionals, technologists, uh, policy makers, uh, to consider the broader information environment and the high level trends that will shape access to information. The reason the insights document is a little unique is it draws together all of that information into a nice, I think it's less than 10 pages, easily digestible kind of think piece and it pulls out the clashes between these information trends. So what does access to information look like when we still have a predominantly north-based information content generation? So what will online education look like if uh, and global access to information look like if the information is predominantly north to south transfer? What does access to information look like in a surveillance environment? How do we manage um, the tools for transparent and open government in the context of corruption, um, political kind of election manoeuvring? And so that insights document very kind of concisely summarizes a lot of these clashes between the high level information trends. So the trend report is out there. You can read it. You can log in and sign up to the kind of density of information that's behind this simple document. So there's expert papers, synthesis documents, background materials, um, a, a kind of wealth of information. And you now, it's over to our members to take the discussion into your region. So what we did was we stepped outside of the library profession and said, well, what would the information environment look like in the next kind of decade to 20 to 30 years, and then worked back from there to, okay, what does that mean for libraries? And we now want to see those conversations taking place in your regions. We would love to see um, an Asia-Pacific discussion with Asia-Pacific technologists, policymakers, um, educators, what's relevant of the high-level trends identified here to your region, what is different, what doesn't apply, um, what do you think are going to be the key trends and to report all of that back to us so we can put it on the platform as well because we do think it is a lot more complex than simply um, putting forward a top kind of five trends that will shape our information environment. We think it is going to be different by region, by type of library, by the communities you serve and we want to see you have those discussions and most importantly, report them back to us. We want, we're creating a blog page. We want to be able to share the discussions, um, share your discussions with other regions and hopefully bring this all back together in Lyon next year to kind of see what the results of that discussion in different regions are. So if you'd like to um, ask more questions about hosting an event, you can by all means um, contact me at IFLA HQ. You can also contact us through this website itself. So when you just go to trends.ifla.org, you'll see a contact button and that comes straight to me as well. My email address is ellen.broad at ifla.org, but the contact box on the website will get you there as well. So if you'd love to, like to hold a conversation, I'd love to talk to you because we really want to see some conversations happening around the world that take it beyond just libraries talking to each other, but to see you hosting your own discussion with the policymakers and the different players, the technologists, the educators, the um, IT professionals that will be relevant to your region. So thank you.
It, it is a good report. I do say so from the organization that produced it, but it's, uh, it, it's quite thought-provoking. And uh, I particularly read the insights document, and then if you're intrigued by that, it's a little bit like an iceberg. There's a huge amount of resources underneath it, so you can follow the topics you're interested in. With that... <laughs> And to do that, and maybe give us some guidance about a plan for the next 12 months. And with that, I'd like to thank you all for coming. I'd like uh, a round of applause, if possible, for our panelists. And uh, I think I can let you out of school five minutes early. Thank you very much.